Welcome everybody to the LBJ Library and Museum. We're so delighted that the Korea Economic Institute has chosen as this year's theme, Presidential Libraries. And we're really delighted that of the four they selected to go to, here we are. So we get to have this delightful conversation with our ambassadors. And I've asked Jim Steinberg, because this is being co-sponsored by the Strauss Institute at the LBJ School. Dean Jim Steinberg will moderate this discussion. So um, with our usual alacrity with the Strauss Institute, I turn it over to Jim for introductions and to get us started in this uh, delightful time. But I want to welcome both ambassadors here and say how delighted we are that you're in Austin and especially at the LBJ Complex. Welcome. Well, thank you, Betty Sue. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, some of you have heard of the very famous Three Tenors Tour. Well, this is the Two Ambassadors Tour, and, uh, and we're really honored to have them here. Um, it's uh, two extraordinarily uh, distinguished diplomats uh, uh, to talk about an issue which is of enormous concern to all of us, and, uh, and it's a great personal pleasure for me to have good friends and colleagues here. It's really three ambassadors, because I should acknowledge our good friend, uh, Ambassador Jack Pritchard. Uh, so we really have it just as good as the tenors here. Um, it's obviously a, a tremendously timely and important visit, and I think the opportunity to reach out, uh, we're grateful to remember that there are many of us past the Beltway who are, continue to be interested in these issues, and so we really appreciate your taking the time and trouble to come and visit us here in Austin. Um, I'm going to introduce the two speakers. I think I'll introduce them both before they begin so we won't interrupt the flow, and then, uh, and then we'll turn to, to their remarks, and then finally uh, questions uh, from, uh, from the audience. We have a very distinguished audience here. I recognize a number of colleagues from the UT faculty and students, and so we're glad you're all here uh, as well. Um, uh, let me begin uh, uh, first with Ambassador Lee, who's sitting to my uh, immediate uh, right. Ambassador Lee really is a, a, a remarkable uh, diplomat who has served uh, for four decades uh, in the uh, uh, South Korean uh, Foreign Ministry and Foreign Service, uh, and has had uh, extensive uh, diplomatic postings around the world, including Liberia, the Philippines, uh, Austria, Yugoslavia, and the EU, and has had uh, a number of senior positions uh, in the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he was a Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, at, the, uh, at the ministry, which is an enormously important role, and then uh, has also uh, been the uh, Korean Ambassador to Great Britain, uh, and and came to the United States in, in 2005. He also uh, participated in Quito, the uh, organization that was involved in uh, the last round of uh, trying to solve the, the North Korean nuclear problem, and so really has seen this from all the different uh, diplomatic angles. Um, we are then to his right, uh, Ambassador uh, Alexander Verschbau, better known to most of us as Sandy Verschbau, uh, a, a really uh, great uh, uh, civil public servant in his own right who has also served in a remarkable series of posts. Uh, I uh, first met Sandy uh, in uh, the mid-1980s when he was uh, uh, at the U.S. Embassy in London, and uh, our paths have, for me, very fortunately crossed extensively over the years. Uh, in recent years, Sandy was senior director uh, for Europe uh, at the NSC uh, during the Clinton administration, where he played an instrumental role in developing the policy that ultimately led to the end of the wars in Bosnia, and, and he deserves considerable credit. Uh, he then uh, uh, extended what had already been an ex uh, a remarkable uh, series of postings abroad uh, to two very important postings in Europe, first as our ambassador to NATO and then uh, as our ambassador to uh, Russia, um, which uh, obviously were enormous challenges of, of great importance in which he handled very skillfully and with a, a wonderful combination of diplomacy but forthrightness, which is characteristic of the leadership that he has always shown, uh, and showing the range that American diplomats are capable of. Uh, of, of showing. He is now our ambassador in Seoul, uh, where he's done a remarkable job in uh, observing and helping manage a transition uh, in uh, U.S.-South Korean relations. Uh, we've got a, a broad-ranging agenda for them to talk about, uh, both in terms of the North Korean nuclear problem and in bilateral relations on both the political and the economic front. So you're here not to hear me but them. And so we're going to begin with uh, Sandy Verschbaum. Thank you very much, Jim. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be here and uh, to once again cross paths with my old friend Jim Steinberg. And it's also uh, a very welcome opportunity to share the podium with my more recent friend and colleague, uh, Ambassador Lee Tae Shik. Uh, this is our third lecture tour uh, crossing the United States uh, under the auspices of the Korea Economic Institute. And uh, this is a very unique institution where the two ambassadors 
from, uh, from Washington and, and, in this case, Seoul, travel around the U.S. together. And I think uh, it's uh, something that has really helped to strengthen the bonds between our two countries and strengthen, strengthen understanding about uh, a relationship that I think doesn't get all the attention that it deserves in this country. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be here at uh, the LBJ Library. Uh, so this theme of uh, presidential libraries has been quite interesting for me as a, as a part-time student of history. And uh, Betty Sue, it's a, it's a wonderful venue, and thank you for the, for the tour uh, earlier. Uh, my wife, uh, Lisa, is, is uh, making this trip with us, along with uh, Mrs. Lee. And she's an artist, and thanks to her, I've learned a lot about Korean art uh, in my uh, two-plus years in Seoul. And there's a famous Korean uh, artist, actually, who was active in the United States, named Pek Nam Joon, who died about two years ago, uh, who said something that I think very succinctly encapsulates the state of Korea today and the state of the U.S.-Korean relationship. Uh, and he said, the future is now. And really, nowhere on earth does the uh, present appear to intersect with the future more than in the Republic of Korea. For those of you who have had the pleasure of visiting Seoul recently, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, because the city really throbs with activity 24 hours a day. High above the streets, there are dozens of giant television screens that beam images uh, that bounce against the glass and the polished steel facades of the ultra-modern buildings, while down below, neon signs uh, that line the streets cast their shadows off of crowds of busy city dwellers who are uh, dressed in the latest cutting-edge fashions and talking on the latest cell phones as well as texting and even watching uh, TV. Punctuating the landscape are at the same time beautiful reminders of Korea's past. Uh, the traffic is whizzing day and night around the stone walls of centuries-old palaces and under the graceful sloping tile roofs of ancient gates and pagodas. It's really quite a fascinating mix of, uh, of the past, present, and future. Some visitors think that Seoul is more evocative of the set of a science fiction movie than any city they, they've ever seen before. So uh, just one day in Seoul can confirm that Pek Nam Joon was onto something in saying that the future is taking shape now in Korea. And that, that's true in the political life of the country as well. Uh, you, you may be focusing on our elections, which are certainly quite fascinating, but uh, the Koreans just had a very important presidential election on December 19th, and they elected Lee Myung-bak, the former mayor of Seoul, to be the next president of South Korea. And he'll take office uh, on February 25th for a five-year term. Uh, the respect for the rule of law and the transparency of the elections uh, were really a testament to Korea's commitment to democracy and also uh, demonstrated just how far the country has come since it held its first open president, presidential elections just 20 years ago. It's very rapid dem democratization. Uh, they had a very lively campaign. Uh, the candidates did things that I think even our candidates uh, at least haven't yet done, but February 5th is still coming, uh, engaging in synchronized dance routines and singing in raucous choruses. Uh, but I think that uh, despite some of the, uh, f the, the revelry during the campaign, in the end, uh, the people of Korea elected Mr. Lee by an overwhelming margin, the largest in Korean history, in fact, on the basis of his vision uh, for the future of Korea. Uh, and in particular, based on his pledges to revitalize the economy, boost economic growth, and expand uh, economic opportunity for Korea's citizens. So Koreans definitely voted for change. And uh, President-elect Lee has uh, emphasized his interest not only in improving the economy, but also in strengthening the Korea-U.S. alliance. Uh, he's also stressed the importance of the complete denuclearization of North Korea. And he's even offered a, a detailed plan to triple North Koreans' per capita income uh, to $3,000 a head, provided that denuclearization is completed. So on these and other issues, such as our important Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, uh, we very much look forward to working closely with President-elect Lee's government. Now, as South Korea makes the transition to a new government, some commentators have suggested that over the last 10 years, uh, uh, there's been a growing distance developing between the United States and Korea. But I don't see it that way. Uh, it's true that we've sometimes had some differences on certain issues. Uh, but having served as ambassador for more than two years now, I think it's striking just how resilient the relationship is and how much our two governments 
have been able to accomplish together. Uh, many of the goals that our two countries have been pursuing for years, peace on the Korean Peninsula, a more mature and balanced military partnership, and tariff-free trade are now within our grasp. So with that as an introduction, let me talk in a little bit more detail about some of the key issues in the relationship. And I'll start with uh, what has always been the, the foundation for the relationship, uh, our, our defense alliance. Even though the Northeast Asian neighborhood has been changing rapidly, uh, our defense alliance has been a reassuring constant factor. Uh, and I think uh, it has also matured considerably in its 55-year history in adapting to changing circumstances. Uh, even with these changes, though, our commitment to each other's security remains as strong now as when we signed our mutual defense treaty in 1953 at the end of the Korean War. So the mutual commitment is the foundation on which uh, our strong friendship has developed. Uh, from the Korean War to the current fight for democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan, South Korean troops have stood shoulder to shoulder with us for more than half a century. And I think the bonds we forged transcend wartime allegiances. Uh, I was very proud just a few weeks ago to see our two Coast Guards working together to discuss how to contain and clean up uh, the tragic oil spill that hit Korea's west coast. Uh, during this time, dozens of U.S. servicemen and women joined the Korean volunteers to help clean the beaches, literally rock by rock, inch by inch. Now, two innovative new measures uh, are taking our bilateral security relationship to a, to a new level. Uh, first of all, our two militaries have developed and begun to implement a comprehensive five-year strategic transition plan that will transfer wartime operational control uh, from today's Combined Forces Command, which is headed by a U.S. general, to the South Koreans' own military. Uh, and this will take place in April 2012. Uh, the transfer reflects the impressive development of Korea's military capabilities, and we see it as the logical next step in the evolution of our alliance. I think it makes sense for Korea to take primary responsibility for its own defense, but with U.S. forces standing by, both on and off the peninsula, to support their Korean allies under any scenario. So our troops are already now working uh, day by day to ensure a seamless transition that provides the, everything that's needed to deter aggression and maintain the peace for the long haul. Now, the second major part of the uh, transformation of our alliance is the realignment of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this involves the closure of nearly 100 bases and camps spread across the northern part of the country, including our main headquarters in downtown Seoul, uh, and moving them to three hubs south of the capital. And this is going to streamline and modernize uh, our operational capabilities while at the same time lowering their visibility, their political profile in the country. In particular, it's long overdue for us to get out of the Koreans' uh, capital. But these changes in no way signal any change in uh, the U.S. commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea. Uh, I think these changes will make the alliance even stronger and better able to meet tomorrow's security challenges. Uh, this doesn't mean that the alliance won't require careful uh, maintenance, but I think that uh, if 55 years of working together have taught us anything, it's that change is the only constant and we've proven very successful in adapting to change. And I think in the years ahead we need to explore ways that the alliance can take on a larger global mission. Uh, building on Korea's growing involvement in promoting democracy and fighting terror uh, beyond the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we're pleased that the uh, president-elect and his team uh, have indicated an interest in redefining the mission of our alliance uh, and building it up beyond its traditional peninsular mission into something which will have broader application in the region and globally. Now, the biggest security challenge that our two countries uh, must address right now is North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons. Over the past year, we've made important progress in the six-party talks. Uh, North Korea's nuclear reactor at Yongbyon is no longer producing plutonium, and teams of U.S. experts have been staying at Yongbyon 
in two-week rotations uh, since last November to carry out the disablement of these facilities. And that's progressing pretty well. Uh, and that's the good news. The bad news is that uh, the North Koreans have not, uh, not yet honored their commitment to fully declare all of their nuclear programs and activities. Uh, the declaration is important because it's the basis for the full denuclearization of the six part, uh, full denucle denuclearization that the six parties committed to in September 2005. When Pyongyang submits a complete and correct declaration, uh, the United States is prepared to take steps on the path to a more normal relationship with North Korea, including removing it from the state sponsors of terrorism list and from the jurisdiction of the Trading with the Enemy Act. But more importantly, submitting a complete declaration would allow us to turn our attention to the crucial final phase of the six-party process when North Korea is expected to fully abandon its nuclear weapons and programs. And it's important to remember what denuclearization would mean for North Korea and for the region. Once North Korea abandons its nuclear ambitions for good, a range of far-reaching changes would become possible. Uh, first, as President Bush has made clear, with full denuclearization, we'd be prepared to establish normal diplomatic relations and open embassies in Washington and Pyongyang. Uh, second, uh, we'd be ready to formally end the Korean War and establish a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula to replace the uh, armistice of 1953, which was supposed to be temporary, but has tenuously uh, been in effect for over a half a century. Uh, third, South Korea and other countries would be prepared to provide North Korea with the development capital and assistance that it desperately needs to modernize its backward economy and improve the lives of its people. Fourth, with North Korea becoming a responsible member of the global community, we could literally transform Northeast Asia, opening up new transportation corridors and markets, as well as new possibilities for regional cooperation and integration similar to what we've seen in Europe since the end of the Cold War. So there's a very positive future out there for North Korea, but we can't get ahead of ourselves. Uh, North Korea still has to make the strategic decision to abandon its nuclear weapons and programs so that it can join the international community. Uh, the uh, administration still would hope to uh, complete this project this year before uh, the end of President Bush's term, but will take as long as it requires. And we're certainly not going to settle for a partial solution that leaves North Korea with, uh, with even a few of its nuclear weapons and some of its material. We're looking forward to very close cooperation with the new South Korean uh, government on these issues. Uh, the president-elect has uh, stressed the importance of, of reciprocity, uh, making clear that substantial economic benefits for North Korea are premised on, uh, on full denuclearization. Uh, and I think that uh, by working together, we hopefully can convince Kim Jong-il to make the right choice. Now, if security issues have been the focal point of the U.S.-Korean relationship uh, for the last half century, trade and investment are beginning to occupy center stage. Uh, in fact, there's been a kind of transformation of our bilateral economic relationship over the past few years. More than any other uh, country in Asia, Korea has opened itself up to foreign trade and investment and has tried to implement economic regulation based on global best practices. And this has led to much greater balance in our economic relationship than with other Asian countries. Uh, Korea is now America's seventh largest export market. And uh, Americans may not know that we export more to Korea than to larger economies such as France, Italy, or Spain. And people may not know that our exports are, are pretty close to the level of our imports. In order to further deepen this economic relationship and create more opportunities for both countries, uh, our two governments decided in early 2006, after extensive uh, consultations with the private sector, to launch negotiations on a free trade agreement. And while the skeptics didn't think we could pull it off, uh, our negotiations were successful, and on June 30th of last year, our two govern governments signed the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, or as it's affectionately known, the Chorus FTA. It's a huge deal, the largest FTA that we've signed since NAFTA, and the biggest Korea has ever entered into. 
Uh, it will remove virtually all the barriers to trade and investment between our two countries. Uh, the benefits will also be enormous for both countries. Uh, for U.S. exporters, the opening of Korea's protected agricultural sector will lead to billions of dollars in increased sales, and the deregulation of Korea's underdeveloped services sector for financial services, professional services like lawyers and accountants, and broadcasting and media uh, will also create huge new opportunities. But U.S. manufacturers will also benefit, whether it be sales of industrial equipment, consumer products, or technology. Uh, Korea is already a huge market. The uh, state of Texas has very significant exports already to Korea. And the FTA will give our, our exporters much better access than uh, other countries have. The Bipartisan International Trade Commission uh, issued a report for the Congress in the fall that concluded that the Chorus FTA will lead to a 10 to $12 billion increase in uh, U.S. GDP, which is by far the biggest benefit of any FTA we've negotiated in the last five years. And they projected at least a $10 billion increase in exports. Uh, now, for Korea, the benefits will be huge, but a little different. Uh, since Korean products already have excellent access to the U.S. market, the main FTA benefits for Korea will be to the domestic economy uh, by deregulating it, making it more investor-friendly, and making it more competitive vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. And the FTA will have spillover benefits throughout the Northeast Asian region as it makes other countries like Japan and China uh, think about what policies they need to undertake to enjoy similar FTA treatment and to avoid being left behind. So the next step uh, that we have to take is for both legislatures uh, to ratify the FTA. Polls in Korea show that the FTA enjoys 65 to 70 percent support among the public, which is a very high figure for a trade agreement in any country. And I think uh, sooner or later, hopefully ne uh, next month, but if not then, sometime in the spring, the Korean National Assembly is likely to ratify the FTA. In the United States, however, uh, we have a much tougher road ahead to get the FTA through our Congress. I think this partially reflects uh, where we are uh, in the public debate. The Koreans have been debating this FTA you know, even before the talks were launched, and after some initial opposition, they came to understand that the overall impact of the FTA will be hugely beneficial to both sides. In the United States, we started the public debate a bit later, really after the FTA was, was signed last June. So to a large extent, uh, the FTA has been defined by its opponents, most notably those in the uh, automobile industry. I find that uh, disappointing since the automobile section of the FTA is actually one of the strongest parts of the agreement, and it will do a lot to resolve all of the issues that our car makers have said uh, have made it hard for them to export to Korea in the past. Now, let me briefly mention what might happen if Congress were swayed by the pressure from the FTA opponents and decided not to ratify this agreement. Uh, I think it would be an understatement to say that the consequences would be dire. Uh, our businesses, our workers, our farmers would miss out on billions of dollars of economic benefits. But uh, failure to ratify the FTA would have a broader impact uh, on whether other countries around the world would view the United States as a credible negotiating partner. We'd be uh, relegated to the sidelines while our competitors continued negotiating trade deals without us. But perhaps worst of all, failure to ratify the FTA would communicate to our longtime allies and friends, the Koreans, that we're not the reliable partners that they thought we were. And I think that rejecting uh, this FTA would be a strategic mistake that we cannot afford to make. But I think that uh, ultimately the benefits of this FTA uh, are so obvious and the consequence of not ratifying the agreement uh, are so grave that uh, the more that, Amer that Americans learn about the deal, the more support they will have for it. But this does require those who support the Chorus FTA to uh, speak out in favor of the agreement and to help shape the public debate. Public debate. Uh, the business community, of course, bears the biggest responsibility as the main stakeholders, but I think those who appreciate the significance of the U.S.-Korean relationship in uh, political and geo geostrategic terms also need to uh, 
speak out as well. Uh, we can't allow the debate to be dominated by a few vocal opponents who want to pass up this extraordinary opportunity. So uh, before I conclude, let me just briefly mention one other subject that is uh, also uh, an important issue, in fact, perhaps the most important issue for the Korean public, and that's uh, Korean inclusion in the visa waiver program. Uh, last year, Congress passed legislation that the President signed into law that lays the, the groundwork for full Korean participation in the program. Under the new law, if the Korean government works with us to put into place various security measures uh, that strengthen the safety and security of international travelers, uh, Korean citizens will be able to travel visa-free for visits of up to 90 days. We're already working to put these security enhancements in place, uh, but some work uh, still remains to be done. We have to put in place a system to better monitor the departures of travelers who've entered without a visa and to, to put into place an electronic travel authorization system whereby Korean travelers would submit their, their data uh, in advance of their trip, allowing us to, to screen travelers before they arrive. Uh, the Koreans, for their part, have to, to introduce an e-passport, which would have a biometric chip embedded in it. Uh, so this work is underway, and I think uh, we should be able to complete that work by the end of the year so that Korea can be in the program by around this time next year. So to conclude, let me come back to the, uh, the notion put forward by Peck Nam Joon that the future is now. Uh, thanks to the close friendship between Korea and the United States, uh, we may soon realize some of uh, our shared aspirations, including the denuclearization of, of North Korea, a more balanced and mature military partnership, increased trade and investment, and visa-free travel that can bring our peoples even closer together. I think that we're together leading our alliance into the future stronger, healthier, and more resilient than ever before. So for Korea and the United States, the future is now, and I think the future is very bright. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Ambassador Lee. Good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, this afternoon we had a tour of uh, LBJ Library, and um, I have to say that I am deeply impressed by the great stature of former President Lyndon Johnson. Um, President Lyndon Johnson, through his lifetime of public service, was uh, distinguished by his commitment to family, faith, and freedom. South Koreans, in particular, appreciate uh, President Johnson's unwavering commitment to freedom and democracy. As a junior senator, he strongly backed President Truman's decision to come to South Korea's defense back in 1950. And when he became president, he welcomed the Korean president, Park Chung-hee, to Washington in May of 1965. And the following year, President Johnson paid a return visit to Korea. With Korean troops engaged with the US in uh, Vietnam, President Johnson assured President Park Chung-hee that the war would not weaken the United States' commitment to Korea's own security. President Johnson's decision to stick by Korea came at the crucial time in our relations, as Korea was struggling to extricate itself from poverty. U.S. support was vital in enabling us to achieve what was to come uh, what was come to be known as an economic miracle. And President Johnson's faith was justified. In the decades since that time, the Korea-U.S. alliance had steadily evolved into a dynamic and mutually beneficial partnership. 
to the point where it is considered as one of the most successful alliances in history. I'd like to update you on our overall bilateral relationship, including our alliance's biggest challenge, which is North Korea, and our biggest opportunity, the pending Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. And i like to be uh, brief and, uh, and broad as much as possible in order not to overlap what uh, Ambassador Borispa has stated uh, in our bilateral ties. In the half century since we turned back the invasion by communist North Korea and China, the Korea-U.S. alliance had successfully deterred further conflict on the peninsula, while also playing a pivotal role in maintaining peace and security in Northeast Asian region. Thanks to this unique alliance partnership, Korea has been able to rise from the ashes of war to become the 11th largest economy in the world. At the same time, Korea has become a fully mature democracy, as is evident by our presidential election last month. The Korean people today are well aware and immensely grateful for the fact that these twin achievements were possible thanks in no small part to the United States, in particular owing to the sacrifice of so many young men and women in the U.S. military, as well as the generous assistance Korea has received through the alliance. This evening we have some of our most distinguished friends of Korea who gave part of their life to Korea when the country was in trouble. Our distinguished Korean War veterans, thank you for joining us, and also Mr. Deckard, who came from uh, Louisiana to join us this evening. Again, my compliments to you all. Looking beyond the peninsula, the communism was defeated in the early 1990s, and globalization brought about further dramatic changes in the international sphere. In the midst of global transformation, Korea itself has, been, has seen dramatic change politically, economically, and socially. Therefore, it follows that we would also modernize our alliance to adapt to the new strategic environment. This is why, during the past few years, Korea and the U.S. have closely worked together to come to a series of agreements to update our partnership and alliance relationship. Korea and the U.S. saw eye to eye on the concept of strategic flexibility. We also successfully agreed on a plan to transfer wartime operational control to the now capable Korean military, as uh, Ambassador Borisov touched upon, the target year is year 2012. We are also implementing agreements to realign and re relocate U.S. military bases in Korea, and the list goes on. These steps are aimed to transform the alliance created during the Cold War into a more dynamic and the proactive relationship that reflects the ever-changing global strategic environment. Not only will the new alliance maintain peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and in the region, it can also play its part in maintaining peace and security in the world at large. The importance of strengthening Korea-U.S. relationship will remain as a priority of Korea's foreign policy and the new administration. Our president-elect Lee Myung-bak announced a seven-point doctrine for his foreign policy, and the boosting of the Korea-U.S. relationship is one of the main components. The so-called MB doctrine, after the initials of his first name, emphasized and I quote, strengthening of the ROK-US alliance to protect and promote 
mutual interest based on the shared values of democracy and market economy, and I unquote. He made it very clear that the Korea-U.S. relationship is the backbone of Korea's foreign policy. President-elect Lee's special envoy visited Washington last week to convey to President Bush and other key figures in Washington the new administration's strong will to enhance our alliance. And President-elect Lee himself will visit the U.S. this spring at the invitation of President Bush. Therefore, we can be assured of the highest level of cooperation and friendship in our bilateral partnership. And I can tell you that our two countries' relationship is in good shape, firm, and strong. That will be the case in the future as well. Looking ahead, one thing that hasn't yet changed, the biggest security threat to the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia remains the North Korean nuclear issue. Korea and the U.S., together with China, Japan, and Russia, are working day and night to resolve this threat through a diplomatic process known as the Six-Party Talks. After a series of ups and downs during the past few years, last year we were successful in concluding two very important agreements. These agreements were specific action plans to implement <coughs> The overarching agreement concluded back in year 2005 where North Korea committed itself to abandoning all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs. In accordance with these two action plans, North Korea has shut down its nuclear facilities in Yongbyon and we are now in the process of uh, disabling them. The North Korea also agreed to provide a complete and correct declaration of all its nuclear programs, including its nuclear activities, facilities, and materials by the last day of year 2007. North Korea has yet to prepare its obligation, and this is why the six-party talks are currently at a standstill. As we know from past experience, negotiations to resolve nuclear threat have never been smooth and have always been time consuming. Therefore, we need to have patience and maintain a creative and open minded approach. Although progress is slow at the moment, if Korea and the US, together with other participants of the six party talks, are able to maintain the focus and the, will, and the will to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and North Korea, I am certain we will see steady progress toward the nuclear weapons-free Korean Peninsula. With all these changes across the spectrum of our alliance, nowhere is the evolution more dramatic than in the economic realm. So I'd like to offer some background on the Korean economy as well as the significant benefits of our pending Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. In 1961, the Republic of Korea with a per capita income of less than $100 was among the poorest nations in the world, ranking perhaps 101st out of 125 countries. Today, some 50 years later, Korea boasts a powerful economy with per capita income of 20000 U.S. dollars, first in the world shipbuilding, LCD, and semiconductors. Our economy is on the path of solid growth. <coughs> Against this successful economic development, Korea-U.S. economic relations have also changed dramatically. From a recipient of U.S. assistance following the war, through the trade frictions of the 1980s and the 1990s, our economic relationship has finally become more reciprocal and mature. Korea-U.S. trade last year surpassed $80 billion, 
with Korea as the United States' seventh largest trading partner, ahead of France, Spain, and India. Investment is also becoming a two-way street. As last year, U.S. companies invested $2.3 billion in Korea, while Korean investment in the U.S. totaled $2.2 billion. Perhaps this town, this town of Austin is well known for Samsung's contribution to local economy. That's also another expression of uh, another development of our two countries' uh, economic relationship. Samsung Austin Semiconductor opened its new facility last June, making high-quality flash memory chips. One of the largest manufacturing plants in the U.S., Samsung Austin's annual payroll is expected to grow from $60 million to about $100 million once the new factory is in full operation. As a way to further fuel our economic growth engine, Korea has undertaken a series of uh, FTA negotiations. We have already completed several, and we are close to conduct concluding another with ASEAN while negotiating additional agreements with major economies like the EU, India, and Canada. An FTA with the United States is of highest priority. However, the Corus FTA, as it is called, would allow Korea greater access to the world's largest market and upgrade our economy to a more knowledge and service-based economy, thus enhancing Korea's competitiveness and attracting additional foreign investment. For the United States, the U.S. International Trade Commission predicts that through this FTA, the economy will see a 10 to $12 billion boost, as Ambassador Burschbau has stated. Further, is the United States' first FTA in Northeast Asia. The Coras FTA links the U.S. economy with one of the most vibrant economies in the world and can serve as a springboard to further promote trade in the region and beyond. If I may describe some key features of this free trade agreement. First, it is big. When the combined value of our two economies exceeding $14 trillion, this FTA will create the third largest free trade area in the world, after the EU and NAFTA. In comparison to the United States, other current FTAs, perhaps with Colombia, Panama, and Peru, Korea's GDP of $900 billion is more than 3.5 times bigger than that of those three countries combined. Further, Korea's trade volume of more than $635 billion is almost six times bigger than for the three countries combined. Second, the Korea's free trade agreement is also comprehensive. It covers the full range of uh, trade-related areas from agriculture to goods and services to IPR competition, labor, and environment. Finally, this is a high-quality FTA. Tariffs on nearly 95% of all goods will be eliminated within three years. In addition, almost two-thirds of U.S. agricultural exports worth more than $2 billion annually will become duty-free immediately. Texas stands to be one of the biggest winners from this FTA. As the Lone Star State ranks second among all 50 states in exports to Korea. Since the year 2001, exports from Texas to Korea increased by 200%, to reach $5.3 billion by 2006. This includes some $2 billion in computer, telecom, and electrical equipment, most of which will become duty-free within three years. Korea also purchases large quantities of Texas plastics, <coughs> resin, and chemical products, including pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, fertilizers, and agrochemicals. Under the FTA, these products will become more competitive and affordable in the Korean market. 
Texas farmers and ranchers also stand to benefit greatly under the FTA as leading Texas exports such as cotton, poultry, beef, and dairy will clearly benefit from improved access to the Korean market. In short, this Korea-U.S. free trade agreement is a rare opportunity and a win-win situation for both our countries. But the difficult process of legislative approval from both sides lies ahead. In Korea, the bill was submitted to the National Assembly last September. Our upcoming parliamentary general election in April this year makes it hard to predict when the FTA might be considered, but it is expected to be ratified sooner rather than later because public opinion is growingly more favorable to the agreement. In the case of the United States, the situation remains a bit more complicated as we face an appeal battle for approval by the Congress. The fact that this is an election year means that, practically speaking, the bill must be considered before summer. Meanwhile, we are operating in an unfavorable political environment, which makes it harder to get out the facts about the sensitive trade issues like beef and autos. The beef issue has been a big roadblock to approval of the agreement by the U.S. Congress because full market access for U.S. beef has been limited in Korea since the outbreak of Medcow disease. However, since last May, when the U.S. became a BSE-controlled country with the OIE, both the governments have made efforts to resolve this issue in a mutually satisfactory way. And I expect those efforts will be approved soon. On the auto issue, despite the fact that the U.S. automobile sector stands to gain immensely from this FTA, there are those who claim that the auto chapter fails to open Korea's market and that revising the auto provision would be necessary to get congressional approval. But if you take a close look at the real situation, the opposition is based on myth, not fact. The U.S. government commended the auto chapter as an unprecedented and strong package of automotive provisions. Neither the Korean government nor the U.S. administration believes that any revising of the auto provision is necessary. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce points out the cost of inaction on the FTA and I quote, U.S. business and farmers would not only lose new access to the Korean market, but also could lose market share as Korea concludes other bilateral trade agreement with global competitors, and I unquote. To elaborate on what a missed opportunity would mean, first, U.S. companies would lose market share in Korea because Korea's FTA negotiations with major economies like the EU and Canada are well underway. Second, the U.S. would lose a valuable geopolitical springboard in East Asia because the core FTA is the only U.S. FTA in this dynamic region so far. Finally, it would also shake the trading partner's trust in U.S. policy while signaling rising protectionism in the U.S. Therefore, at this important juncture, we would certainly welcome your support in communicating to your representatives in Washington the importance of early passage of this landmark bill. In fact, you have probably noticed that a big theme on the campaign trail these days is the change. Well, let me suggest this positive and powerful change to boost business and directly improve the everyday lives of both Koreans and Americans, and that is to ratify this pre-trade agreement in the first part of the year. In sum, I am optimistic for the Korea-U.S. partnership. I believe our shared history and common goals will stand us in good instead to meet any challenge we may face. Further, with the renewed commitment of President-elect Lee's administration to enhancing U.S. ties, we can foresee that the future-oriented transformation of our alliance will gain even more momentum in the years to come. In closing, I'd like to take a moment to recognize 
our distinguished Korean War veterans here with us today. On behalf of my fellow Koreans, I'd like to extend our most profound appreciation and thanks. You were there during the earliest and most typical chapter of our alliance, and your selflessness and courage have meant the difference between tyranny and freedom for generations of Koreans. You answered your nation's call to protect a country you never knew, people you never met. And had it not been for your sacrifice, Korea, as we know it now, would not have existed. I hope you can take pride in the alliance we have built and the progress we have made because of our success is also your success. Our pride is also your pride. On the basis of your sacrifice, we were able to rebuild the country, which is the 11th largest economy in the world. I hope you believe today that the Korean War was a war worth fighting, the country was worth protecting, and the people were worth saving. And the war was not a forgotten war, your sacrifice was not in vain. Today, with your permission, let me just welcome our distinguished Korean War veterans who joined here this evening. Mr. Louis Deckard, President of Korean War Veterans Association. Mr. Marvin Dunn, President of the State Department and the National Director, and uh, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jim Keel, President of the East Texas Chapter 286, and his wife, Margaret. Thank you, sir. Ray Knarl, President of the General Walter Walker Chapter 215 and wife, uh, Mrs. Betty. <laughs> and Mr. Bill McSwine, a National Director, and his wife, Barbara. <laughs> Special acknowledgement to our uh, Korean War veteran, Jim Oxford, who is uh, in a seriously ill condition. And he's a decorated Korean War veteran, um, awarded the Purple Heart and Bronze Star. He's now in serious condition. Our appreciation and thankfulness uh, to him. And we wish him well, and uh, God bless him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Lee, for, and uh, Ambassador Firstbaugh for these terrific remarks. And uh, let me join in uh, expressing our appreciation to the vets who are here today and joining with us. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, before I turn to the audience, I'm going to take advantage of the, the privilege of the chair to ask our speakers a couple of questions. And um, Sandy will be relieved to know that, no, I'm not going to ask him about the North Korean uranium enrichment program. No, I'm not going to ask him about what, if any, involvement the North Koreans had in Syria and the, the, uh, the site that was bombed by the Israelis. Uh, but rather, um, Sandy, you talked a lot about the challenges of negotiating with the North and, and our expectations there. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the dynamics of the other parties uh, to this negotiation. There's a lot of perception on the outside that while there's certainly a broad agreement among the United States and South Korea and Japan and China that other things be equal, a non-nuclear uh, North Korea is in everybody's interest, that there are a lot of differences in both the priority uh, uh, attached to that as opposed to other objectives uh, and, the, and the ways to get there. The Japanese focus on the abductees and worry about the missiles. Uh, Chinese worried about stability along their border and, and what would happen if there were collapse in the north, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what the, the state of play there is, uh, how these different uh, slightly at least divergent interests are, are playing out and, uh, and how they, are, they may affect the negotiations mm -hmm. going forward. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we, we remain convinced, even as the negotiations have hit a few bumps in the road of late, that uh, you know, a multilateral framework um, makes much more sense than trying to address this on a strictly bilateral U.S.-North Korean relationship. This is a basis. This is because you know, other countries in the region obviously are just as threatened, maybe more threatened, by the North Korean's pursuit of nuclear weapons, but also the other countries have uh, different forms of leverage to bring to bear and uh, collectively we perhaps can be more effective in holding the North Koreans to account, uh, in holding them to their obligations. So I think that uh, it's true that uh, we maybe have gotten better performance from some than from others of our partners. Uh, the Chinese, I think, have really stepped up, uh, if one looks back over the last couple of years, and they serve as the chairman of the six-party process. And I think in particular after the uh, missile tests and nuclear tests of 2006. Uh, the Chinese who definitely don't want to see uh, North Korea remain a nuclear armed state uh, joined with us in the UN Security Council in imposing some serious uh, Chapter 7 sanctions and uh, they've played a very active role since then. Uh, could they use a little more of their economic leverage? Perhaps. Uh, but I think overall we've we value the Chinese uh, contribution um, a lot. I think they're perhaps, after the South Koreans, the most important partner. Uh, the Japanese have been somewhat limited in their effectiveness because of their preoccupation with the abduction issue. But of course, that's a very serious issue when uh, uh, I think it's 17 of your citizens were, were kidnapped by North Korean agents back in the 70s. Uh, so it's a very emotional issue for the Japanese people. But we do uh, hope that some progress can be made so that the Japanese can join with the others in uh, carrying out some of the commitments that the other five have made on economic uh, support for the North as an incentive for it to denuclearize. The Russians have been perhaps less active than they, than they could be as well, uh, although they have more recently agreed to become uh, one of the major contributors to energy assistance to the North. Uh, I think in the longer term, the Russians have considerable uh, influence that they could bring to bear if, if, they, if they decide to do so in terms of uh, promoting regional energy and transportation initiatives that could really help in breaking North Korea's isolation, knitting together the economies of the region, and uh, you know, giving the North Koreans a real stake in long-term stability rather than in being the kind of odd man out, the, the destabilizing uh, factor in uh, in the region. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Ambassador Lee, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, generational change in South Korea and the implications for the bilateral relationship. Um, there's obviously uh, a very dynamic uh, younger generation uh, becoming more and more influential uh, in South Korea. They obviously, their own history and memories are different than that of their predecessors. You've also had, uh, over the last 20 years, a dramatic deepening of the relationship between South Korea and China beginning with normalization, extremely uh, close e and growing economic ties, hundreds of thousands of uh, young South Koreans studying in Chinese universities now. Uh, and my question to you is, how does that affect the, the way in which uh, the, the politics are seen in South Korea in terms of where South Korea sits uh, as the political uh, evolution develops in Northeast Asia between potential tensions between the United States and China and what role South Korea might play in the long term as that generation becomes more and more influential? Uh, the generational shift is taking place everywhere, not only in Korea but also in other countries as well. And therefore, this is not unique for Korea. But one, one can uh, say that uh, back in the year 2002, when we had this presidential election, the participation by the young generation people were somewhat uh, very active, and that uh, contributed a lot to the election outcome. That is true. Uh, nowadays, of course, we will have to ask who they are in terms of uh, what they have in mind how they believe, uh, how they look at themselves in relation to uh, the country's uh, connection or relation with the uh, international community and so forth. Of course, we know that these people have no, never known anything about the Korean War. 
which is the kind of watershed um, event for Korea as a whole. So these people, young generation people, have uh, born after the war without knowing much about the problems and difficulties of the country being faced by their parents and uh, elderly generation. And therefore, their view is somewhat different from uh, the perspectives that uh, their parents uh, have, 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 have obtained. Uh, that is true. But if we could uh, um, talk about a little bit further what they believe and what they think and what they behave. I mean, even if, uh, even if they say something critical about the great power, but they still um, enjoy the jeans, enjoy the Coca-Colas, and the cult rock and roll music, and so forth. So it, it, it's something that's quite common everywhere. And therefore, this is uh, not something that we are extremely concerned about. As time goes by, these people will change, and they will become much more mature. Uh, and when, when I come back to your earlier point about uh, the, the general views with respect to uh, the U.S. or Korea's relationship with the U.S., I can tell you that uh, more than 85, 83, 84 percentage point of Koreans are looking at the United States as the most reliable partner for security, peace, and prosperity. So that, that's quite a, quite a steady number, which also includes young generation people. 83, 84 percentage point of Korean public regards the United States, the key nation, to provide stability, security, and support. Our relationship with China has dramatically uh, developed in the past 15 years. We established our diplomatic ties only back in 1992. Now in 15 years' time, China has become number one trading partner for Korea. Quite many Korean students are in China for study. It, it's very uh, natural that uh, when, our two con when the two countries' relationship has dramatically uh, developed over the 15 years' time, each other's interest will be involved there, and more interaction and association will take place economically, politically, and otherwise. And yet what we have to understand here is that Korea is a small country, not a big country, living in the neighborhood of uh, large nations. And our history is uh, riven with conflict, uh, and sacrifices. So when you talk about Korea's relationship with its neighbors or big countries in the neighborhood, you have to try to understand the mentality of the Korean people. Throughout our history, we were the victims of great power rivalry in East Asia. So in order for us to avoid any similar circumstances in the future, we will have to develop a good relationship with our neighbors. That is what is happening uh, with, in, in our relationship with China. But no less important thing is that here in the United States, Korea is the largest student-sending country in the United States. The total number is about 100,000. This involves secondary education and beyond. So here, even in the United States, Korean students are the largest community studying here in the United States. More than Japanese, more than Chinese, more than Indians. What does that mean? We are keenly interested in further developing our two countries' relationship, even from the perspective of our young generation. That's why they are coming here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a microphone, or maybe two microphones here in the middle, so I'd invite uh, those of you who'd like to ask a question to come up to the mics and uh, take advantage of our very distinguished uh, Visitors, please. Eugene, if you just uh, go up to the uh, the mic and introduce yourself to our guests. And Hi, uh, I'm Eugene Goltz. I'm a professor at the LBJ School, and uh, um, I'm curious about uh, the automobile aspect of the 
uh, free trade agreement in particular. I just wanted to um, push a little bit. The dispute going back to the 1990s, um, the United States has complained that the Koreans don't buy enough American cars and uh, have said it's because of tariffs, tax policy, a whole set of things, which I gather are more or less cleared up by the free trade agreement. And so for Ambassador Virchbaum, my question is, the fact that the automobile makers in the United States are still complaining, does this not suggest that they knew all along that this wasn't true, that actually the reason American cars weren't selling in Korea is what the Koreans have said for all these years, which is, gee, our roads are smaller, the cars are too big, they don't have the right fuel things, there are a whole set of other explanations. And then if that's true, the question for Ambassador Lee is, um, if South Korean people are confident, or the South Korean government is confident that actually it's not the tariff barriers that have been the problem with selling American cars to Korea, uh, what would it cost you, given how important the free trade agreement is to the future of U.S.-Korean relations, to just give in more, say, oh, the Americans want to renegotiate this, um, just give them the whole store on cars because, yeah, you're not going to buy cars from America anyway. There's no threat to the American, to the Korean car industry. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll go first. I think that the Korean market certainly has not been a very productive one in the past for American car makers. Uh, part of it, I think, was uh, just a cultural bias in Korea going back many years uh, against buying foreign cars. And then there were both tariff, very high tariff barriers and other non-tariff barriers. But I think the market is changing rapidly. I mean, the foreign penetration is increasing steadily. I think it's now slightly over 5% in terms of actual imports. But you also have to keep in mind that three of the five car makers in Korea are foreign owned. And uh, when we say that the U.S. auto industry is, ag is against this agreement, there's a big asterisk because GM is neutral. But in fact, GM has about 11, 12 percent of the Korean market through its ownership of Daewoo and is turning it into a very successful platform for exports as well as sales in Korea. And it's the, the platform for their future mini car development. And Renault has a very successful stake in, uh, in Samsung. So uh, foreign cars or foreign cars made by foreign companies are uh, occupying an increasing share of the Korean market. And I think that we've seen Chrysler and Ford, who are much more opposed to the agreement, uh, increasing their sales by 50 percent from an admittedly low base in the last few years. So the situation is, is changing. And we believe that uh, Koreans are now more ready to buy foreign cars, not just the luxury models, which have been sort of the leaders in, in the import sector, but now some of the cars for the middle class consumers are beginning to sell well. So uh, this agreement does eliminate all the tariff barriers and virtually all of the non-tariff barriers that we've been complaining about for years. Uh, so it comes down to effective marketing. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not the roads. The roads, I drive a big, my, my official car is a giant Cadillac, an armored Cadillac, which somehow manages to get through the streets of Seoul. And we're not suggesting people buy those. But uh, normal sized cars, uh, large, medium, and small, are, n are now perfectly suitable, and you're seeing more and more of them. So even Cadillacs uh, of the, you know, this new convertible, uh, Chrysler Sebrings are selling well, PT Cruisers are, are out there, uh, Ford Escapes are doing well. So the numbers are still small, but the potential is there. But uh, uh, that's why we think the agreement does stand as negotiated. But I'll let Ambassador Lee answer your question, Tim, on whether they should nevertheless <laughs> agree to some additional provisions. Let me ask you one question. Uh, does the U.S. automobile industry export a lot these days, uh, particularly on this passenger car? Do they do that? Well, as I understand, that is not the case. I mean, they are buying up foreign automobile company to uh, occupy the market share or to advance foreign market rather than producing automobile here in the country and then export it abroad. That's not the case. So you have come up with different market strategy for your own automobile industry. And that, is, that you will have to know. That's one thing. And also another thing is that, uh, you know, I happen to ask a couple of uh, our or my close friends who happen to be the business CEO in the country. 
and I asked him, how many cars do you own at home? One of uh, uh, whom told me that he owns three cars at home. And I asked him, what type of car do you own at home? He said rather shyly, one is uh, Nissan, the other one is Toyota, third one is Honda. <laughs> what does that mean? Now, when it comes to our uh, automobile chapter, let me give you some details. We have uh, eight point percentage point of uh, uh, tariff on passenger car. You have 2.5. So we agreed to remove this eight point and 2.5 differentials immediately. And also, in the case of uh, pickup truck, you maintain 25 percentage point of higher tariff rate on imported cars, while we have 12 percent point. Okay? In the case of pickup truck, our tariff rate is 12, yours is 25. What we have agreed in the chapter is that we gave you, we gave you 10 years grace period or phasing out period for your 25 percentage point of tariff, while we agreed to remove or eliminate our 12 percentage point tariff rate immediately. So your industry stands to gain more than we do. Aside from this, we were being complained about the taxation system and so forth. So we agreed to simplify this system from five complex, one, two, three. And also, we used to charge 10 percentage point of automobile consumption tax across the board. We agreed to halve it. So we lowered it from 10 to 5 percentage point. And also, on environmental standard and safety standard, we are not going to apply Korea's strict environmental standard on U.S. automobiles. Rather, we gave some years of grace period to U.S. automobiles. And also, what we have agreed is that if Korea is being found to have violated the free trade agreement, then we gave you the authority to bring back 2.5 percentage point of your tariff on Korean cars. So this is a snapback formula. This snapback formula gives you the right to reinstate your tariff rate on Korean cars. Now, this is unprecedented formula. No previous free trade agreement has such formula. And this is what we have done. Now, when it comes to this automobile trade deficit, you have about $45 billion of trade deficit with Japan on automobile. And you have $25 billion of automobile tariff our automobile trade deficit with uh, Canada, and also $23 billion deficit with the EU. You have only $10 billion deficit with Korea. And yet, we are going to offer you the market so that you could come to enjoy the market. Unless we do this free trade agreement, Korea will not be in any position to lower the tariff rate, to remove the tariff rate to remove the non-tariff and tariff barrier. The only thing we can do <coughs> through this pre-trade agreement, we are ready to do this. And if you are not going to uh, accept this opportunity, and if you are not going to come to Korean market with this formula, then what else we can do? And this is why we say that this automobile chapter is something that we can abide by, and that is why USDR had said time and again that no alteration on this automobile chapter because it reflects U.S. interests rather well. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Pat. Oh, please. I'm one of the Korean veterans here tonight. 
We're very pleased to have been invited and enjoyed your presentations, and I do have a question. We're all getting older, and as we've gone through our years, the Korean War has been known as the Forgotten War. Sadly, that's true, even in our own schools. They don't teach much about the Korean War, but we feel that it was a very successful event. I think you can see from what you said that it was successful, and South Korea has done very well. And we feel like that we performed a, a great service. Those who made the sacrifices were many, but I think we did good. In our Korean War Veterans Association, we have a program called Tell America. We have chapters all across the U.S. that go into the schools and work with the teachers and tell them about the Korean War and especially show that freedom is not free. Someone paid the price for the freedoms that we enjoy today. My question for you, Ambassador Lee, is, and I've heard that some of the Korean children don't know about the Korean War either, that in some of those that are growing up don't really feel the United States served the cause as we think we did. Could you tell me what they teach in the schools there now about the Korean War, and do the children believe that we made sacrifices that are worthwhile? Uh, perhaps uh, it may be true that here in this country, the war is not well known. But here, uh, there in Korea, this war we cannot forget. And um, we, Koreans, young and old, <coughs> perhaps you are not well remembered here in this country. I may be wrong, but you are well remembered in Korea. What you have done for my country back in the early 1950s that has become the basis on which we were able to rebuild our country. And Korea has become rather successful in nation building. And that is why I said that our relationship or Korea's policy toward the United States or our alliance partnership is the backbone of Korea's foreign relations. This will not be forgotten. Yes, in the course of uh, Korea's uh, democratization, some of the political activists who might not want to look at our relationship with uh, the United States from the proper perspective, they may skew, they may distort the reality, they may try. And yet, as I have said, majority, more than two-thirds, 83, 84 percentage point of Korean publics will remember you, your sacrifice, and how much we are indebted to you. That will be the case in the future. So we will, we, our, our students, they learn a lot about the Korean War at school, and that will not be forgotten. We will continue to teach our children and our young generation to know more about how much sacrifice you have made, and even afterwards, how much assistance and help U.S. has extended to Korea so that Korea has become what it is now. One thing, when we talk about our two countries' uh, relationship, also what we will have to remember is what we can do about North Korean problem as a whole. This problem has not gone away even after the war. Still, we have this North Korean problem. But back in 1950s, we tried to resolve the issue by military means. But nowadays, what we are trying to do in the context of inter-Korean relationship is on the basis of your sacrifice, we are going to achieve or we are going to deal with North Korean problem by other means. That is, by peaceful means, 
if we are going to achieve our intended goal of uh, peaceful reunification, that is what you wanted to achieve back in 1950s and yet failed, and yet this is the kind of dream that we, are, we have in mind to achieve in the future. So on the basis of our relationship or partnership, alliance partnership, on the basis of your sacrifice, we are going to achieve our intended goal and that is the reunification by peaceful means. That much we share the views, we share the values, we share the dreams. And please, please uh, don't ever think that the Koreans have forgotten your sacrifice. No, that is not the case. Again, thank you very much for your sacrifice and hard work on that basis, we were able to forge a new relationship between our two nations, and also we become so successful. So we cannot forget you and your sacrifice. Thank you. I'm uh, Patricia McLaughlin. I'm from the Department of Government and the Center for East Asian Studies. And first of all, thank you very much for your remarks. I found them very interesting, and I learned a great deal from them. Um, I have a question about for both ambassadors that relates to the unfolding financial problem in the United States. And it's my understanding that in some countries, this issue, we don't know how big it is yet, but this issue is raising questions about the degree of financial integration with the United States. And I'm wondering if this is playing out in South Korea as well and to what extent it might be playing out. For example, are there questions about South Korea's reliance on the dollar? Um, are there questions about the level of financial integration between the two countries? Is there a debate bubbling as there is in several other countries about the need to diversify trade relations? And I think more to the point of today's remarks, will this have any fallout for the negotiations and the ratification, rather the ratification of the free trade agreement? Thanks. You know, uh, back in 1997, 98, Korea has uh, encountered with financial crisis. And so we are not, uh, uh, I mean, alien to the kind of crisis that you have here um, in the nation. After this financial crisis, Korean economy has become much more um, successful, primarily thanks to the privatization, primarily um, leaving major economic decision to be made by the private sector rather than the government-driven uh, decision. So after the financial crisis, Korean economy has become much more viable and successful, of course, in the course of which our economy has become much more integrated with the global economy, which is led by the United States and so forth. So of course, yes, because of this subprime mortgage crisis, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, the, the impact uh, is being felt there. But nowadays, what I can tell you, rather interesting uh, development, is that we would like to make our, we would like to open our financial sector rather poorly as a result of this uh, free trade agreement. There, particularly in the service sector and the financial sector, uh, U.S. company can come over to own uh, service company in Korea or financial organizations or you can open branch office of any bank and so forth. So we are going to be fully integrated with U.S. Uh, financial sectors uh, as a result of this free trade agreement. And obviously, we are going to feel some kind of uh, problems as a result of this crisis here. But that's what, what we have to uh, face uh, as a part of global economy. But uh, we, we what, what, what I can tell you also is that the Korean economy is uh, becoming a bit more successful and uh, as a result of which more Korean companies will come to the United States for investment. So there is a uh, mutual um, action between the two economies. Once you have this crisis here, that will be obviously felt in Korea, but at the same time, 
Korea is trying to make uh, itself much more successful here in the United States. That's what is going on. So uh, I hope that uh, we can, uh, our, our two uh, finance uh, industries uh, can work out uh, some cooperative mechanisms under which the economies in Korea will not be affected rather than serious manner. But we will have to work together. Yeah, not much to add. I mean, yes, of course, Koreans have been very concerned about the Im potential impact on them and about uh, impact on the global economy of uh, of uh, the difficulties we're going through now. And uh, I think that uh, you know, they, by opening up their economy and ca carrying out the kind of liberalization that uh, we encourage and the IMF encourage, uh, they've you know, staked their future on integration with the global economy. Uh, but I think uh, we've seen important steps by the Koreans to, to contribute to solutions. Uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund recently made a large investment in, uh, in Merrill Lynch. And I think that uh, I mean, it shows a sense of uh, responsibility on the Koreans' part as a government entity uh, in trying to uh, you know, cushion the, the shocks of uh, recent weeks and try to help get past the current situation. Uh, so, uh, you know, decoupling, uh, the people have spoken about, I don't think has happened. Uh, yes, uh, particularly an economy of, you know, medium-sized as Korea is, is still very much affected by what happens here. But they're taking a very responsible approach, and we consult very closely with them uh, to try to work together on these kinds of issues. If I could also just jump in uh, and respond to uh, the question from our distinguished veteran, uh, I, I, I'd just like to at my two cents here to say, uh, you've not only done good, you've done great. Uh, and I think that uh, it is uh, important for Americans to remember uh, the sacrifice that you made, because this is perhaps the best example of where a U.S. military in intervention far from, our, far from our shores paid off in such a big way in terms of saving a country's freedom, enabling a real model country to emerge that is a strong democracy, one of the strongest economies in the world. I mean, this is something we can all be proud of. I mean, every, not every intervention of the United States has had such unequivocally positive uh, results. Uh, so we should all celebrate that. And I think that uh, Ambassador Lee mentioned how some political forces over the years, particularly during some of the most volatile periods of democratization, tried to distort the past offer a revisionist version of history in which the U.S. was blamed for the Korean War rather than for, for saving Korea. And some of that, unfortunately, kind of crept into textbooks uh, uh, under the guise of what was called unification education, where you know, the North Koreans, because they shared a common blood, were seen as m m more positive, and their role in starting the Korean War was somewhat uh, blurred in the textbooks. I think that the government that's coming in has, has talked about taking a look at those textbooks. But what's striking for me is, and I spend a lot of time visiting college campuses, speaking with young people, because we are very interested in ensuring that they understand the value of our relationship, even if they don't have the direct experience of the Korean War. What, what I'm struck by is that despite these problems in the textbooks, the Korean kids know their history very well, and they know what the United States, United States did. and they, they see their interests still linked to the United States uh, in ways that is very heartening. It's not you know, a sentimental attachment, perhaps, the way their grandparents feel, uh, but it's, uh, I, I think, a reflection of their sort of awareness of, of the world around them and their affinity for American culture, uh, lifestyle, uh, and a sense that uh, you know, I think there is something, a sense that there is a shared history that they may not have directly experienced in the terms of the war, but it still makes our relationship uh, especially close even to this day. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> this uh, textbook, that's not the classical textbook. <laughs> you know, we have uh, quite a strong influence uh, played by, being played by teachers, trade unions. And these teacher trade union is uh, all pauper, and they come up with different stories about our past. And uh, they teach 
somewhat skewed perspectives to our students. That's the problem. But here, again, I mean, you could see revisionist perspectives uh, emerging from everywhere, even here in this country. You see a lot of revisionist perspectives on your own past uh, history. And therefore, that is uh, nothing new. And also, uh, as time goes by, the people and the students are being disillusioned with what they have learned from this uh, teacher's trade union and, and so forth. So they become much more objective. They are much more well aware of what has taken place in Korea. Well, the issue of textbooks is a lively and vibrant one, even here in Texas, but we're not going there tonight. So uh, let me ask you uh, on this very positive note about uh, the importance of U.S.-South Korean relations uh, to, uh, to thank our guests and, and everybody in the audience for being here for a terrific and lively discussion. Thank you all both very much. Thank you.